You're listening to the expository preaching ministry of Kootenai Community Church, located in Kootenai, Idaho. We pray that Christ is exalted and your spirit is blessed by the teaching of God's Word. For more information about Kootenai Church, please visit us online at kootenaichurch.org. Ecclesiastes. And let us pray before we begin. Our Lord, we are grateful for your word which speaks to the, the, the things that are going on in our world and in our hearts. We thank you that your word equips us to understand all of these things and to understand all of the events that are unfolding before us. We thank you that your word encourages us and edifies us in those things. And we pray that today as we begin a study of the book of Ecclesiastes that you would open our hearts and our minds to these things and help us to Retain the information that we're about to cover as we introduce this book. May you be glorified here through our study and our time together. In Jesus' name, amen. The book of Ecclesiastes, this was not the first time that I preached through this book. I preached through this book back in 1997, only three years after I started uh, pastoring here at Kootenai Community Church, and I was only 27 years old at the time. And then I taught through it in a bit of a different format in 2005. So you may ask, why go back then again to the book of Ecclesiastes? And I've got a few different reasons why we are, why I am wanting to tackle this book again. Uh, first, this will be something of a break from the New Testament, a little bit of a different genre, a different, uh, uh, something different than what we have been doing. I was going to do the book of Hebrews right after the Gospel of John, but the book of Hebrews and the Gospel of John have so much material and themes that overlap. The book of Hebrews is about the personal work of Christ, and the book of John is about the personal work of Christ. And as we are preaching through the Gospel of John, you will probably remember that on more than one occasion, I asked you at the beginning of the service to turn to the book of Hebrews for a scripture reading because there is so much parallel theology and and parallel themes there. So it's not that I want to stay away from preaching on the person and work of Christ. I'm not afraid of that at all. Obviously, we spent seven years in John doing that. But I thought maybe something just a little bit of a breather, a little bit of a break from what we have been doing and uh, allow you to take, allow us to dive into something different kind of take a breath before we jump back into what I think is probably the second most theological book in the New Testament, if not the most theological book, and it's going to be uh, hard work, and that would be the book of Hebrews. So the book of Ecclesiastes fits that bill. Uh, Also, last Sunday I was falsely accused by one of the elders who happens to be preaching through 1 Peter that I stole his thunder before he ever got a chance to preach his message. So by going into the Old Testament, that will help me to avoid any uh, themes or theologies or topics that might be related to the book of First Peter. So we'll be in the Old Testament for the next 80 years until he wraps that up, and then we can jump back into the New Testament. And then a second reason for doing Ecclesiastes is I wanted to do a better job of preaching through this book than I did back in 1999. Um, preaching now, this will be almost 20 years that I've been preaching uh, here at Kootenai Church, and you would think that have doing something for 20 years that I would be better at it than I was back when I started. Um, and at least I would be able to lull you to sleep quicker in the sermon than I used to. And for some of you, that would be a welcome improvement in my preaching. But I have a bit more skill and ability and, and understanding now. And I want to approach Ecclesiastes with that um, improvement. I don't know if you'd call it improvement, but I will just for the sake of argument. I want to do a better job going through it this time than I did the last time. And the third reason for tackling the book of Ecclesiastes is that the themes and the thinking and the mindset and the lessons that we learned from this book are pertinent to the age in which we live, the culture in which we live. Ecclesiastes is a book that is written from the perspective of under the sun. Everything that Solomon is addressing is life as it is under the sun, man-centered, man's philosophy. What do you get when you remove God from the picture and want to live your entire life apart from his perspective, without his wisdom, just with man's wisdom, man's philosophy, uh, life as it is, as man wants to live it, approaching everything from man's perspective, what do you get? You get, well, wake up, America, and look around you. This is what you get, right? You get rampant hedonism. You get the selfish pursuit of pleasure. You get gender confusion. You get sexual promiscuity. You get a culture and a nation that is in decay. You get the demise of Western civilization. You get an entertainment and educational system that is absolutely devoid of anything spiritual or anything that is based in truth. You get moral relativism. You get postmodernism. Um, you get injustice in your courts. You get a political system and an ideology that is absolutely devoid of anything spiritual or anything that is based on truth. 
You get modern day America is what you get when you remove God from the scene. You get the murder of a million babies a year in the name of reproductive freedom. You get people who are pursuing the highest office in the land who have promised to abuse executive power. And then you get a nation full of people willing to vote for such people. You get a culture and a nation that doesn't understand the purpose of work. And so they would rather sit around and have government abuse its power to take from other people who work and give to them to buy for them whatever they deem to be their right this week or whatever they think they have a right to this week. And because they don't understand labor and they don't understand work and why God has done that and why it is good to have his perspective on anything. So you get modern day America. That's what you get. This 3,000 year old book reads like yesterday's headlines. And you'll see that as we go through. Now, as best as I can remember, there are six people sitting here. Two of them are gone. So there's about four people sitting here who were in this church back when I preached through Ecclesiastes the first time in 1999. And fearing that those six people, this is not including my, my family, my wife and my two oldest kids who don't remember this because they were sitting, still sitting around uh, soiling their diapers at the time. But the, those six people, I, I feared somewhat that those six people might think that I was just grabbing old stuff and trying to rehash it and sort of take a break, kick back, put my feet up and just preach what I've preached already and hoping that nobody would remember it. So I went to a couple of them and I asked them, you remember when I preached through Ecclesiastes? How do you feel about me going through the book again? And one person said, yeah, I vaguely remember you preaching through Ecclesiastes, but I don't have a clue what you said about it. And the second person said, you preached through Ecclesiastes? <laughs> so now I know that I can revisit this book, and so that's what we're going to do. This is a difficult book. Ecclesiastes is a difficult book. It's challenging. There are a lot of interpretive challenges, which you'll see here in a minute. There are a lot of passages which, which tax our ability to understand them and sort of put them into the larger narrative of Scripture. Martin Luther said of the book Ecclesi- of Ecclesiastes, this book is one of the more difficult books in all of Scripture, one which no one has ever completely mastered. Another commentator said this, 2,000 years of interpretation have utterly failed to solve the enigma. And another commentator said Ecclesiastes is a lot like an octopus. Just when you think you have all of the tentacles under control, that, that is that you have understood the book, there's one flopping around out there in the air. That's a vivid picture, isn't it? And Ecclesiastes just happens to be, by far, my favorite book in the Old Testament. It's my favorite book. It is the most difficult book to interpret, but it is my favorite book in the Old Testament. And that's saying something because I have a lot of love for the book of Psalms and the book of Proverbs. But amongst those three top favorite books in the Old Testament is the book of Ecclesiastes. All right, so I want to give you some introductory details of the book and I've said before I don't like doing introductions. I would rather just grab a text of Scripture and work from the top of that text to the bottom of the text and then grab the next text the next week. You know how that works. Um, uh, Introductions to books, I think, are necessary evils. Uh, I don't like doing them, but I have to do them because understanding any text in terms of its context requires that we understand the context of the whole book. And that is particularly true with the book of Ecclesiastes. Because there's so much difficulty in this book, we have to understand the perspective and the mindset of the author and who the author was and when and why he wrote the book. So that's what we're going to be covering this morning. And with your Bible open to Ecclesiastes, in a moment, I'm going to have you flipping back and forth to a few different parts of the book. So get ready to turn some pages and read a few selected verses. Let's begin with verse 1. Uh, let's begin first with the title of the book, Ecclesiastes. It's kind of an odd-sounding title, isn't it? Kind of a weird title for a book, Ecclesiastes. You can understand Isaiah because Isaiah wrote it, or Jeremiah because Jeremiah wrote it, or Lamentations because it's filled with Lamentations. Those are all easy. Psalms are filled with Psalms. But what is the book of Ecclesiastes? Where do we get that name? Those of you who are familiar with some of the theological terms that we toss around in the New Testament uh, under the New Covenant might see some similarity between the title Ecclesiastes and the Greek word ekklesia. And ekklesia means called out or uh, it has the idea of assembling people together or calling them out. That's the ecclesia, And it's translated in the New Testament as church. And the title Ecclesiastes does come from a form of that word ecclesia, But it is the Greek translation of a Hebrew word, kohelet. Q-O-L-E-T-E-H. Kohelet. No, kohel. That all of those letters are in there, but maybe not in that order. Kohelet is the Hebrew word, and it's translated preacher in verse 1. So you read in verse 1, the words of the preacher. That's the words of Kohelet. And the word Kohelet in its Greek translation is Ecclesiastes. So these are the words of Kohelet, the words of the preacher, the words of Ecclesiastes. 
So now the next question is, and by the way, it just meant one who assembled people together. So kind of the idea is these are the words of one who assembled together a group of people in order to communicate to them these principles or this wisdom or these life lessons that he has learned. It's kind of an address that he is giving giving to a bunch of people whom he has called out and called together and assembled together for that purpose. So who is Kohelet? Who is the preacher or Ecclesiastes that these words, the book, this book contains his words? Well, verse 1 is the key to it all, and though his name is not mentioned, verse 1 and the details of the book give us uh, some clues as to who the author is. The words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. Now, son of David helps nail it, uh, narrow it down quite a bit, but David had a lot of sons, didn't he? He had a number of sons, but which son became king in Jerusalem? Well, there's only one son of David who became king in Jerusalem, and that's Solomon. Uh, David was king after Saul. Saul was the beginning of the, the monarchy. And after Saul, God chose David as a man after his own heart, uh, not looking on the outward appearance as people had with Saul, but on the heart. And he saw in David uh, that David was his chosen one. So God selected David. David became the king of Israel. And then his son Solomon uh, took the throne after David um, after David died. So this book not only doesn't, though it doesn't name Solomon, it gives the indication that what we're talking about is the son of David who became king in Jerusalem. And then as we read through the book, we see all of these other details that fit with what we know to be true about Solomon. So, for instance, in chapter 1, verse 16, you see that he speaks of having wisdom. I said to myself, Behold, I have magnified and increased wisdom more than all who were over Jerusalem before me, and my mind has observed a wealth of wisdom and knowledge. Who could it be said of that he had more wisdom than any who had been in Jerusalem before him? Well, we know that that is true of Solomon. Furthermore, we know that Solomon engaged in a number of building projects. Chapter 2, verse 4 describes those building projects. We know that Solomon amassed a massive amount of wealth in his kingdom. Chapter 2, verse 8, describes the wealth that Solomon enjoyed and the wealth of this author. And then we also know that Solomon had a number of wives and concubines. Chapter 2, verse 8 says, I provided for myself male and female singers and the pleasures of men, many concubines. So who does that describe? It describes Solomon. And then as we read through the book of Ecclesiastes, we get, we get a picture of life. We get a picture of a man who is saying these things who had turned his back on God and began to be, begun to analyze and evaluate everything that is in life from man's perspective, apart from the wisdom of, of heaven and the wisdom that God would offer, and apart from any revealed divine truth. It is all from man's perspective. So what son of David, who was king in Jerusalem, who had wealth, uh, engaged in building projects, had many concubines, also turned his heart away from God at the end of his life? That would be Solomon. So Solomon is the undisputed author of the book. Now, if you want a little bit of an overview of Solomon's reign and his life and what happened to Solomon and with Solomon, you can read a couple of big passages in the Old Testament. First of all, you can read 1 Kings chapters 1 through 11 and 2 Chronicles chapters 1 through 9. Those are the two extended passages that give you the most detail about Solomon. 1 Kings 1 through 11 and 2 Chronicles 1 through 9. And if you want to keep up with us, I would recommend that you read those two passages maybe in this coming week. But let me give you a quick overview of the life and downfall of Solomon. When Solomon, when Solomon took over for his father David, he took over a kingdom that was at peace on all sides because David was a man of war, a man of bloodshed, a man who had conquered his enemies, and nobody threatened David because he was a mighty man of valor and a mighty man of war. So the kingdom was at peace, and when it was handed off to Solomon, Solomon took over a kingdom that wasn't really uh, threatened by any outside forces or any nations around him. And God approved of Solomon even at the beginning of his reign. And 1 Kings 3, verse 3 says, Now Solomon loved the Lord, walking in the statutes of his father David, except he sacrificed and burned incense on the high places. So there were multiple places where sacrifices to God were made. Solomon did that. That displeased the Lord. But by and large, Scripture says that Solomon walked in the statutes of his father David and obeyed the Lord. And he loved the Lord. That was how Solomon began. And at the beginning of his reign, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream, and he said, Ask of me anything you want, and I'll give it to you. And Solomon didn't ask for riches. He didn't ask for honor. He didn't ask for women. He asked instead for wisdom. And he said to the Lord, I have charge over all of these people, and I want to lead your people in a way that honors you and according to your words. So give me wisdom and discernment so that I may go out and lead your people as I should. Solomon understood his weaknesses, understood his shortcomings, and he wanted God to give him the gift of wisdom to overcome those shortcomings. And so God approved of that, and he said to Solomon, and 1 Kings 3, I have done according to your words. Behold, I have given you a wise and discerning heart, so that there has been no one like you before you, nor shall one like you arise after you. I've also given you what you have not asked, both riches and honor, so that there will not be any among the kings like you all your days. 
So God was so pleased with Solomon's request for wisdom that he heaped upon him not only the wisdom, unlike any other man had ever had, and unlike any other man ever would have, but he also gave to Solomon riches and honor. First Kings chapter 4 says, Now God gave Solomon wisdom and very great discernment and breadth of mind like the sand that is on the seashore. Solomon's wisdom surpassed the wisdom of all the sons of the east and all the wisdom of Egypt. For he was wiser than all men, and his fame was known in all the surrounding nations. He also spoke 3,000 Proverbs, many of which are recorded in the book of Proverbs. And his songs were a hundred, a thousand and five. A hundred, sorry, not a hundred thousand, one thousand and five. He spoke of trees from the cedar that's in Lebanon, even to the hyssop that grows on the wall. He spoke also of animals and birds and creeping things and fish. Men came from all peoples to hear the wisdom of Solomon, from all the kings of the earth who had heard of his wisdom. And remember the visitation from the, of the Queen of Sheba? When the queen arrived and Solomon took her through the temple that he had built and the palace that he had built and showed her his throne and the seating of his servants and the table and the food that he set before all of his assistants and in his entire administration, walked him through the land and showed her the wealth. A queen of another nation, it says, there was no spirit left in her. She was just utterly undone by what she saw. She didn't say, you know what, this is a little bit better than what I have. She was completely stymied by what she saw. It was utterly amazing. So much so that Scripture says the silver was worth nothing in the days of Solomon because it was still plentiful. So Solomon took a kingdom that, uh, that had been ruled over by David. It was at the peak of its military strength, threatened by no one, and he turned that into a nation that was at, the, at its height of economic strength and economic prosperity. The nation was so wealthy under Solomon because of his wisdom and because of how he handled everything and because of the justice that he did that the Lord blessed it, unlike anything that had ever happened before. Unlike anything at the time, and unlike anything since, it was truly an astronomical kingdom under Solomon. Amazing kingdom. and It had the blessing of God. But oh, that the story stopped there. But it doesn't stop there, does it? Here's what First Kings chapter 11 says. Now King Solomon loved many foreign women, along with the daughters of Pharaoh, Moabite, Ammonite, Edomite, Sidonian, and Hittite women. From the nations concerning which the Lord had said to the sons of Israel, You shall not associate with them, nor shall they associate with you, for they will surely turn your heart away after other gods. God had warned them, Do not associate with these nations, because they will direct you into idolatry. Solomon held fast to these women in love. He had 700 wives, princesses, and 300 concubines, and his wives turned his heart away. For when Solomon was old, his wives turned his heart away after other gods, and his heart was not wholly devoted to the Lord his God, as his father, heart of his father David had been. For Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and after Milcom, the detestable idol of the Ammonites. Solomon did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and did not follow the Lord fully, as David his father had done. Then Solomon built a high place for Chemosh, the detestable idol of Moab, on the mountain which is east of Jerusalem, and for Moloch, the detestable idol of the sons of Ammon. Thus also he did for all his foreign wives who burned incense and sacrificed to their gods. Now the Lord was angry with Solomon because his heart was turned away from the Lord. The God of Israel who had appeared to him twice and had commanded him concerning this thing, that he should not go after other gods. But he did not observe what the Lord commanded him. God warned him twice. And Solomon turned his heart away from the Lord. Ford Ottman in his book, God's Oath, writes this of Solomon. A king never came to a mighty throne with a greater promise than Solomon. Yet Solomon failed. Ascending the throne, girded by omnipotence itself, he ended his career, shorn of his strength, bereft of his glory, and with his heart turned away from Jehovah, and the anger of God kindled against him. That was his end. The anger of God kindled against him in his latter years. The beginning, he walked with God and in the ways of his father David. Now what happened between Solomon building a temple to the one true God and then turning around and building temples to Moloch and all of the gods of the Sidonians and the Ammonites. What happened between those two things? The book of Ecclesiastes happened. What happened between Solomon writing the Song of Solomon that portrays the, the beauties of marital love and fidelity and a monogamous relationship? What happened between that and having a thousand women at his disposal? The book of Ecclesiastes happened. What happened between Solomon walking in the commands of his father David and in the commands of God and being obedient to that and the downfall at the end of his life where he turned his heart away from the Lord and the anger of the Lord was kindled against him? What happened between those two events? The book of Ecclesiastes happened. So we get in Ecclesiastes, and this is the value of the book, we get in Ecclesiastes the journal of a man 
who tried to find meaning in everything under the sun, and he has come back to report to us the outcome of that search. Vanity and vain. Vanity and vain. So that is Solomon. That is Solomon. Now, we encounter some difficulties in the book of Ecclesiastes, and I want to give you an example of a few of them. First, in the book of Ecclesiastes, we see a number of passages that seem to contradict themselves. And this is where I want you to turn to a couple of them. Look first at Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 18. Chapter 5, verse 18. Here is what I have seen to be good and fitting, to eat and drink and enjoy oneself in all one's labor in which he toils under the sun during the few years of his life which God has given him. For this is his reward. Solomon says, this is what I have seen to be good and fitting. You want to know what is good and fitting? It is this. Now look down to chapter 6, verse 12. For who knows what is good for a man during his lifetime? Wait. In the same column in my Bible, at the top of that column, here's what is good and fitting. At the bottom of that column, who knows what's good and fitting? Right? How do you reconcile those two? Look back at chapter 2, verse 2. I said of laughter, it is madness. And of pleasure, what does it accomplish? Solomon looked at laughter, he said, that's insanity. He looked at pleasure and he said, what good does pleasure do? What does it accomplish? Look back at chapter 8, verse 15. So I commended pleasure. For there's nothing good for a man under the sun except to eat and to drink and to be merry. For this will stand by him in his toils throughout the days of his life, which God has given him under the sun. I said of pleasure, what does it accomplish? It doesn't accomplish anything. So I commended it. It's useless, so I recommended it. That's what we have in those two verses. Seemingly contradictory, isn't it? Look back at chapter 12, verse 8. And this is the the back of the book, and the first part of the book says vanity, vanity is all is vanity. Look at chapter 8, verse 8, chapter 12. Chapter 12, verse 8. Vanity of vanity, says the preacher, all is vanity. Everything is vain, useless, empty, senseless. Everything is. What is? Everything is. Is there anything that is not included in the statement all? No, all includes what? All, everything. Everything is useless and empty. Now look at chapter 12, verse 13. The conclusion when all has been heard is fear God and keep his commandments because this applies to every person. For God will bring every act to judgment, everything which is hidden, whether it is good or whether it is evil. If everything is meaningless, then serving God is what? Meaningless? Solomon doesn't say serving God is meaningless. He says everything is meaningless. And then he says, but serve God. Well, hold on. If there is a God and if there is a judgment, then not everything is meaningless, is it? If there's a God and if there's a judgment, then everything is meaningful. Not everything is meaningless, empty and vain. And not only are there seemingly contradictory passages in this book, there are a few very odd, difficult to understand, and even outlandish and outrageous statements. Go back to the beginning, and I'm just going to walk you through a few of them. Chapter 1, verse 18. Chapter 1, verse 18. Because in much wisdom there is much grief, and increasing knowledge results in increasing pain. In much wisdom there is much grief. Isn't that the exact opposite of what the book of Proverbs is all about? Right? In much wisdom there is honor, there is length of life, there is security, there is safety, there is blessing. You ought to pursue wisdom. And yet Solomon says here, in much wisdom, there is... There is grief and and increasing knowledge results in increasing pain. Did you ever think you would read a verse inspired by the Holy Spirit that says wisdom results in grief and knowledge results in pain? You think you'd see that? Look at chapter 3, verse 18. I said to myself concerning the sons of men, God has surely tested them in order for them to see that they are but beasts. For the fate of the sons of men and the fate of beasts is the same. Hold on a second. The fate of the sons of men and the fate of beasts is the same. Do we all go to the same place? Verse 19. For the fate of the sons of men and the fate of beasts is the same. As one dies, so dies the other. Indeed, they all have the same breath. And there is no advantage for man over beast for all his vanity. No advantage for man over beasts. All go to the same place. All came from the dust and all return to the dust. Who knows that the breath of man ascends upward and the breath of the beast ascends downward to the earth? I have seen that nothing is better than a man should be happy in his activities for that is his lot. For who will bring him to see what will occur after him? Psalmist says nobody can know what's going to come after a man. So it's good just to live your life. Because there's no advantage for being a man over being a beast 
over being a, an animal. Look at chapter 4, verse 2. So I congratulated the dead who are already dead more than the living who are still living. But better off than both of them is the one who has never existed, who has never seen the evil activity that is done under the sun. Congratulate the dead, but better off than both the living and the dead is the one who has never existed. By the way, you can't be a one if you have never existed. Did you notice that? Right? If you have existed, the only way you can be one is if you have existed. If you never existed, you, we don't talk about people who have never existed because They've never existed, right? They're not one. But but better is the one who has never existed than the one who has lived or the one who has died. But better off than the living is the dead man. What do you make of verses like this? Look at chapter 7, verse 1. A good name is better than a good ointment, and the day of one's death is better than the day of one's birth. That's a verse you'll never see inside of a Hallmark card. Congratulations. Maybe that's one that we should start putting in greeting cards that we give away at funerals. The day of one's death is better than the day of one's birth, so congratulations on your death of your loved one. Look at chapter 7, verse 16. Do not be excessively righteous and do not be overly wise. Why should you ruin yourself? Did you ever think you would read a passage of Scripture inspired by the Holy Spirit that tells you not to be excessively righteous or excessively wise? A passage of Scripture that seems to suggest that wisdom and righteousness end in your ruin. If you pursue it too much. And it only gets worse. Look at verse 17. Do not be excessively wicked and do not be a fool. Excessively wicked? Don't be excessively wicked? As if wickedness is okay. Just don't overdo it. Just do a little bit of it. You want to kind of balance wisdom and foolishness. You want to balance wickedness and righteousness. In fact, that's what verse 18 says. It is good that you grasp one thing and not let go of the other. For the one who fears God comes forth with both of them. You want to fear God? A little wickedness, a little righteousness, you know, hold on to both of those. A little wisdom, a little folly. What do you do with verses like this? This is, this is going to be fun, isn't it? Look at chapter 9, verse 2. This again is another one of those passages that seems to suggest there's no afterlife, there's no immortality. Verse 2, it is the same for all. There is one fate for the righteous and for the wicked, for the good, for the clean, for the unclean, for the man who offers a sacrifice, and for the one who does not sacrifice. As the good man is, so is the sinner. As the swearer is, so is the one who is afraid to swear. Whether you're righteous or wicked, we all go to the same place. That's what Solomon seems to be saying. Look at chapter 10, verse 2. Just a couple of more. And a wise man heart, wise man's heart directs him toward the right, but the foolish man's heart directs him toward the left. What in the world does that mean? I saw that posted recently on Facebook. Someone is suggesting that that's why I'm a conservative or a white right winger, because those are the wise people, and the fools happen to be the leftists. And that's what Solomon seems to be suggesting, right? Well, I happen to believe that leftism and people who are on the left are fools, and they have foolish policies, but that's not what this verse is describing or talking about at all. But it is somewhat perplexing and curious, is it not? Look at chapter 10, verse 19. 10, verse 19. Men prepare a meal for enjoyment, and wine makes life merry, and money is the answer to everything. I knew that verse was in there, right? You knew that if you read your Bible long enough, you'd come across a gem like that. I mean, that will preach. Money is the answer to everything. That could be Joel Osteen's life verse if he read his Bible and could find that. Because that's his message. Money is the answer to everything. But doesn't that seem to contradict everything else we read in Scripture about money? And the purpose of money? And the love of money? In fact, it does even contradict something that Solomon said earlier in chapter 5, verse 10, when he says that he who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves abundance with his income. And this is vanity. But money is the answer to everything? Boy, I can't wait till we get to that one, right? And this brings us to, these are some of the difficulties. We have not only the the seemingly contradictory verses, but also the difficult to understand, perplexing, and even sometimes outrageous and outlandish verses, like some of the ones that we've been looking at. And this, this points out why it is that we have to understand the perspective of the author and understanding these verses in their context and how it is that the Holy Spirit could inspire these things and put them down like this is going to require that we understand the vantage point from which Solomon is writing and his mindset at the time, and what the purpose of the Holy Spirit is in recording some of these statements. And that's going to mean that we've got to walk somewhat circumspectly through these things and evaluate some of Solomon's statements in light of the rest of Scripture, and we will do that. 
Let me give you, and this will be the last thing that we look at this morning, let me give you some of the themes and the, uh, the words that Solomon uses, which kind of are indicative to us of the perspective from which he writes. Uh, two main ones. The first one is vanity, and you see it in the very opening verse of the, of the book, or the, verse 2. Vanity of vanity, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. And that word vanity means useless, empty, meaningless, senseless, futile, worthless, it's that idea. And, and he's saying there that, that begins the book of Ecclesiastes. And then when you get to the end, chapter 12, verse 8, he repeats it again, almost like bookends on the front and the back part of this book. Everything is vain and everything is vain. And everything in the middle is describing that, of what that vanity looks like and, and how you arrive at that vanity. And here is a list of some of the things that Solomon says are vain. Every effort, fruits of our labors, pleasure, life, youth, success, wealth, desire, frivolity, popularity, injustice, all future events, and in chapter 1, verse 2, and chapter 12, verse 8, everything. They said, Jim, if you just said everything at the beginning of that list, you could have saved us that whole list, right? Because that whole list is in, all summed up under that one encompassing statement that all is vanity. The word vanity is used 38 times in this book of 12 chapters, 12 short chapters, 38 times. Vanity. The second word or phrase that is used is the phrase under the sun. And you see that in verse 2, uh, verse 3. What advantage does man have in all his work which he does under the sun? And that phrase under the sun is used 29 times in 27 different verses in this book. Vanity 38 times, under the sun 29 times. And this describes Solomon's perspective. It is everything in this world, in this life, under the sun. It's all horizontal. We are all under this massive ball of fire in the sky, and everything that Solomon talks about is from that vantage point, down here, horizontally speaking, without the perspective of heaven. It's the perspective of this world, this world upon which the sun shines. Everything he's describing in all of his mentality is under the sun. Doing away with divine wisdom, doing away with divine revelation, taking God completely out of the picture, here is what life looks like. You might say that the book of Ecclesiastes describes the mindset and the life of atheism in full bloom. What does it look like to live completely without any God in the picture? Solomon did it, and now he is reporting to us exactly what that life looks like. The word labor is used 25 times, the word work is used 12 times, and the word man is used 70 times in the book of Ecclesiastes. And you get a flavor Some idea of Solomon's perspective? It's all about men. So what he is doing is Solomon is evaluating wealth and poverty and investing and inheritances and family and marriage and children and pleasure and sexuality and money and politics and business and political leaders and the kingdom and every other piece of life that you can imagine, these little tiny pieces that we put together that we call life, Solomon is evaluating all of them, each and every last one of them, from the perspective of man under the sun. Take God out of the mix, and what do you get? You get the book of Ecclesiastes. Now, we're not going to take God out of the mix as we go through it. We're going to walk through the journal of a man who had all of that wealth, all of that influence, all of that power, all of the pleasure that he could want. He had the means to evaluate and search out everything under the sun for meaning and to do it without God in the picture at all. And then he wrote a journal. And he's saying, you want life under the sun? You want life from man's perspective? You want life without God? This is what you get. Insanity. That's atheism. This book, 3,000 years old, 3,000 years old, reads like yesterday's headline because it addresses the modern American church. It addresses our culture. It addresses our political scene. It addresses our educational institutions. It addresses the spirit of our age, which is moral relativism, secular humanism, and postmodernism. That was Solomon. So it's going to be fun. Right? So force yourself to smile. And we will dive into the book of Ecclesiastes starting in verse 1 next week. Let's pray. Father, we know that our life is not to be lived and our life does not exist apart from you, apart from your guidance and direction and apart from your word. 
We thank you that you have given to us this book, this revelation of, of what life is like when we remove you from the picture. And we don't desire that. We don't want to do that. But these things will help us to understand the mindset of a culture around us. And we pray that you would give us that insight and wisdom in the days and weeks to come. We pray that you would be glorified as we seek to live our lives, not from the perspective of under the sun, but from the vantage point of divine wisdom and divine revelation. May this book serve to create in us a hunger and a thirst for truth and for righteousness and for wisdom and help it to equip us, we pray, that we might reach a lost and dying generation. We ask these things in the name of Christ our King. Amen. Thank you for listening to the latest podcast from Kootenai Church. If you'd like to learn more about Kootenai Church or to donate to our church ministry, you can do so online by visiting KootenyChurch.org. We hope you enjoyed this podcast and pray you'll join us again next time. Once again, thank you for listening.